Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. As we continue our study through the book of Ezekiel, we will be finishing chapter 16 uh, this evening, barring some um, questions that come out of nowhere that we have to park on, but I doubt that's the case, but you never know. So this is the fourth lesson that we're going to be dealing with chapter 16. And uh, we, as we mentioned, we'll always give a little bit of summary to get those who may not have listened to the previous lesson. Uh, so far, we've looked at God's care for Jerusalem. Uh, he saw her as a, an abandoned baby, and he took her, and he cleansed her, and he bathed her, and he nurtured her, and he raised her up to a beautiful young lady who turned and rebelled against God. And now God is telling us all about her sin, and that God has to judge her because of her sin. And in this lesson, we're going to look at uh, Jerusalem's shame, uh, and then we're also going to look at future restoration. And that's the thing about God. God does not punish you and abandon you. When God punishes you, He does so for your own good, to restore you and to bring you back to Him. So let's begin with uh, uh, <coughs> verse 53 of chapter 16, Jerusalem's shame. When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then will I bring again the captivity of thy captives, in the midst of them, that thou mayest bear thine own shame, and mayest be confounded, confounded is another word for confused, in all that thou hast done, and that thou art a comfort unto them, when thy sister Sodom and her daughters shall return to their former estate, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former estate, then thou and thy daughters shall return to your former estate. Now I just want to pause here for a moment. When God mentions daughters, the daughters of a city, what is he referring to? We talked about that last lesson. Who remembers? The That's right. The inhabitants of the city. Right. He refers to the inhabitants of the city. And sometimes we'll see the prophets talk about the daughter of my people. That's the inhabitants of my people. The inhab inhabitants of Jerusalem. Verse 56. For thy sister Sodom was not mentioned by thy mouth in the day of thy pride. And that's true because Sodom was no longer in existence when Jerusalem sinned. Before thy wickedness was discovered as the time of thy reproach of the daughters of Syria and all that are round about her, the daughters of the Philistines, which despise thee round about. Thou hast borne thy lewdness and thine abominations, saith the Lord. So again, these daughters are the inhabitants and cities are what in what gender are they in the English language? What was that? That's right, female. So when you talk about a city, you talk about as she. So therefore, a city's daughters, we are the daughters of Orlando. Does that make sense? We are the inhabitants of Orlando. or The daughters of Orlando, that's us. It kind of sounds weird, but that's the way it is. We are the inhabitants of Orlando. Verse 58. Thou hast borne thy lewdness, and now we have to be careful in today's. We say, I'm a daughter, because uh, the way things are going with the, all the gender transitioning. We have to be careful. <laughs> I identify as a daughter. You got too much facial hair, my friend. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Verse 58. Thou hast borne thy lewdness and thine abominations, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord God, I, I will even deal with thee as thou hast done, which hast despised the oath in breaking the covenant. <clears throat> so here God is telling us that at some future date, he's going to restore Sodom. And he's also going to restore Samaria. And he's also going to restore Jerusalem. And he says he's going to bring the captives back. That's the promise. Now, it's easy for us to understand the return of the Samaria and the restoration of Samaria and the restoration of Jerusalem because we know they were Jews and the Samaritans were taken captive by the Assyrians about 727 30 BC and the inhabitants of the southern kingdom of Judah were taken captive by the Babylonians in three waves under the king uh, Jehoiakim, the king Jehoi uh, Jehoiakim, and finally King Zedekiah. So I have this little chart here I'm going to be showing you a couple of times. Uh, for those of you who are uh, going to be watching the video, just pause it and take a look. And you can find this online. It's uh, Josiah's family tree. Josiah's family tree. So those of you who are on Zoom, uh, just us here, uh, but you can see that. <clears throat> right so if you're watching this video at a later time just pause it and uh, it's a handy reference chart to show how uh, how Josiah, Jehoiakim, Jehoahaz, Zedekiah and Jeconiah 
how they are all related. It's interesting that under Josiah, King Josiah, the greatest revival took place in the nation of Israel. And then after he died, in the generation of his children, Israel got the worst that it ever has been, causing God. Do you want me to copy that? No, no, it's not needed. If I do, who wants a copy of it? Anybody want a copy Later, of the chart? After. Okay. okay. So we'll photocopy for those of you who are here. So that's just uh, the family tree. And we know that uh, we have three waves of captives, like we said. Again, Jehoiakim, Jeconiah, and Zedekiah. Jehoiakim, Jeconiah, and Zedekiah. <clears throat> now, who knows where the 70 years, Jer uh, Jeremiah 70 years is counted from. When do we start counting? Who's captivity? Jeconiah. Jeconiah. Now, Jeconiah is called two other names in the Bible. He's called Kaniah, and he's called Jehoiakim. So Jeconiah has two other names in the Bible. He's called Kaniah, and he's called Jehoiakim. And according to God, he's the last uh, descendant from, the, from David, the physical descendant from David, who's going to sit on the throne. God said, there's, there, there's not a man going to be sitting on the throne after Kaniah. But the... So we understand that God would restore Samaria. He would restore Jerusalem, because these people did come back after the captivity. But what is... Strange is that God says He's going to restore the captivity of Sodom. Now, did Sodom ever go captive? <coughs> Correct. Sodom never went captive. What happened to Sodom? That's right. The city was burnt up. So it's difficult to understand how Sodom is going to be restored when they did not go into captivity, but they were in fact burned. Uh, there are five cities that God had slated to destruction: Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma. Zeboim and Zora, all located near and around the Dead Sea, the present-day Dead Sea. Now, here is the, an aside. God said, now this is very important, I want you to pay attention. God said he's going to destroy these five cities. He pronounced judgment on these five cities. Did he destroy all those five cities? Why did he not destroy, who was that? Lot. Lot. God did not destroy Zorah because of Lot. And what did Lot do to keep God from destroying Zorah? He interceded. He interceded. He interceded. You see that why that's important. So when you have a lost family member, I believe your the way you live, the way you behave, and your intercessory prayers can affect that person's eternal destiny. Oh, God knows. Yeah, he, that's God's foreknowledge. But how do you know if God knew that that person was going to get saved or, or not get saved because of you? Think about that for a moment. Think about, for that, about that for a moment. Anyway, so we'll get back to the lesson. So God makes it clear that Sodom and Samaria would return to their former state. That is, they would be inhabited again. So when you read all this, then you have to put your thinking cap on. So how in the world is Sodom going to be restored when it's already been destroyed how's that going to happen so when you when you think about that you have to say that it is perhaps that god is talking about some future time period because he says i will bring again the captivity of the captives in the midst of them that means these places that are desolate are going to be inhabited and we know right now that there's people living in those towns in the, in the country of jordan but did you know that during the Millennial Kingdom, God says that all strangers living in the land of Israel would be allowed to inherit land amongst the children of Israel? And he says that in first um, in Ezekiel chapter 47, 22. Ezekiel chapter 47, 22. Now in the Old Testament, a stranger could not inherit land. They could buy land, they could buy land, but they could not inherit it. If a stranger bought land in the land of Israel, Guess what he had to do at the year of Jubilee? Sell it back. Sell it back. To the family, not to the person he bought it from, but to the family it originally belonged to. So for example, 50 years of Jubilee. If I bought the land at the beginning, at year one, at year 50, I would get full price for the land. I would have to sell it back to the family. I couldn't keep it. If I bought the land at year 40, 
You see that? Then I, have, then I would pay less for the land, and I would get less back for the land, because it's very close to the year 50. So the law was written in such a way that when you buy land in Israel, you had to, at the year 50, return it back. You get paid, you get your money back to the family it originally belonged to. That's what God said in the law. So a, a stranger could not inherit any land. But God says in Ezekiel chapter 42, 47, excuse me, verse 22. Now when we get to Ezekiel chapter 40, Ezekiel is the only book in the Bible that talks about what the millennial kingdom is going to be like. What the civil law, ceremonial law, and uh, moral law is going to be like in the millennial kingdom. Okay, the millennial kingdom is still your future. So God devotes nine chapters, I believe, <coughs> 40 to 48, talking about the millennial kingdom. So let me read you verse 22. And it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by lot for an inheritance unto you to the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall beget children among you, and they shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. They shall have inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. See, that's millennial kingdom doctrine here. And verse 23, And it shall come to pass that in that tribe that the stranger sojourneth, there shall you give him an inheritance, saith the Lord God. So once we get to Ezekiel chapter 40, we're going to talk about the millennial kingdom and the third temple and the sacrifices that will be started again. Did you know that? In the millennial kingdom, nations will have to bring sacrifices to Jesus Christ. Mm. So that messes up the theology of many. Uh, <clears throat> let me read you the, where I was talking about the year of Jubilee. And that's found in Leviticus uh, chapter 25. In the year of this Jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. Then in verse 24 of the same chapter, and in all the land of your possession, ye shall grant a redemption for the land. So when you bought some land that did not belong to you, but belonged to, let's say, uh, the tribe across the street, at the year of Jubilee, you have to give that land back. You get money for it, but you have to give it back. That was the law. So based on this information, so when God is saying he's going to restore Sodom, which did not exist at the time that Ezekiel was prophesying, I believe he's talking about a future restoration and I believe this restoration refers to the millennial kingdom. Again, I, this is just my speculation here. I cannot be dogmatic about it, but I believe that's what God is talking about. But restoration also is going to be given to Jerusalem. And we know from Scripture that uh, Jerusalem will be restored once she has done, once she has paid for her sins. Once she has done paying for her sins. I'm trying to find the correct uh, English phrase here. The day would come when God's season of discipline on his people would come to an end. Does that make sense? God has appointed unto Jerusalem a certain time where he was going to punish them for their sin. And when that time is up and God has dealt with her sins, and the, God will again restore Jerusalem. God has to punish Jerusalem because they broke the covenant that God had made with them. And we're going to deal with this covenant that God made with Jerusalem in the next passage here. So now we go back to chapter 16, verse 60, and this is talking about Jerusalem's future restoration. Verse 60. Now again, God punishes, but God also restores. Nevertheless, I, this is God speaking, I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth, and I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. Then thou shalt remember thy ways and be ashamed when thou shalt receive thy sisters, thine elder and thy younger. Who are these sisters here? Sodom and Samaria. When thou shalt receive thy sisters, thine elder and thy younger, and I will give them thee for daughters, but not by thy covenant. So when God says, I will give them thee for daughters, that's another clue. What do we talk about daughters? Right? What are daughters? Inhabitants, right? I will give them to you as daughters, which means is that in the future, the Sodom is going to be inhabited, and so will Samaria in the land of Israel. You see that? Mm -hmm. And we just read Ezekiel that the, the strangers will have inheritance among the Jews. So that's what God's speaking about. He's speaking about a future restoration. And I will establish my covenant with thee 
and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Very important wording here in verse 62. God says, I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. There's only one time when Israel truly, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, will truly know who the Lord is. And when is that? At the Millennial Kingdom. At the Millennial Kingdom. That's the only time when Israel shall know the Lord. Does Israel know the Lord now? They don't, right? They do not know. In fact, what are they waiting for right now? What are the Jews hoping for? They're hoping for a Messiah. And this Messiah that's going to come is going to be who? The Antichrist. And they're going to be deceived because they rejected the Messiah. And now a false Messiah is going to show up and they're going to receive him. What was that? They're going to believe him. Yes, they're going to believe him and they're going to welcome him with open arms. And I will establish, verse 62, And I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded, and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame, when I am pacified for thee, for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord. One thing about God is he always keeps his promises, and he follows through, uh, I was going to say, he follows through with his promises, and he keeps his covenants. God Judge, has to judge sin and God said he was going to judge Jerusalem but God said even though I'm going to judge you even though I'm going to put you to shame I will never forget my covenant with you when Jerusalem was young when Jerusalem was yet a pagan city a city of the Jebusites God made a covenant with her that she would be God's city forever think about that what type is that Jerusalem was a pagan Canaanite city and God looked upon that city and says I'm going to make you mine forever. Who, who can see the typology there? No. Exactly, exactly. A type of a salvation. God looks at us. We were lost. We were in the world. We were in Egypt, so to speak. And God says, you're going to be mine. And he saved us. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to give you some verses to show you the covenant that God made with Jerusalem. That that city is going to be his forever. What was Jerusalem called before it was called Jerusalem? What's another name for it? Jebus. Uh, what's another name for Jerusalem, spiritually speaking? It begins with a Z. Zion. Do you ever come across the word Zion in the Old Testament when you read the book of Psalms? What is it talking about? Jerusalem. It's talking about Jerusalem. Yes, that's how it is. Jerusalem, Jebus, Zion. Zion would be the future name. It's still called Zion. Or it's like the spiritual when they name. Say Zion, it, he means in the future. It, it, it was also called Zion in the days of David. Okay. David called it Zion. It's the Mount Zion. Yes, that's the that's the hill that the temple was built on. Psalm one thirty two verse thirteen, for the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. You see that. He hath desired it for his habitation. Psalm 48, verse 2. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Do you see that? Zion is the city of the great king. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion. And will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Do you see that? Is there any doubt that Zion is Jerusalem now? No. Right? Because we have the scriptures. I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Again, Zion, Mount Zion, Jerusalem, that is the eternal city of God. God said, you are going to be my city. And why do you think that people are fighting over Jerusalem? Because everybody wants to lay claim of God's city. The Catholics want it. The uh, Protestants want it. The Muslims want it. The Jews want it. The, the Orthodox want it. Everybody wants the city. They're all fighting over it. Be why? Because it's God's city. Matthew 5, 34 through 35. Matthew 5, 34 through 35. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Mount Zion in Psalm 48, verse 2, Mount Zion was the city of the great king. So if there's any doubt that Mount Zion is Jerusalem in your mind, has been erased, hopefully, through the scriptures. 
So Jerusalem's restoration, God says, would bring humility to Israel, not only toward God, but also towards those they had previously despised and judged. When thou shalt receive thy sisters, who is Samaria and Sodom, thine elder and thy younger, Jerusalem despised Samaria and despised Sodom. <coughs> but God said, when I'm going to restore these cities in your midst, and they're going to live beside you and next to you, you're going to be ashamed because you judged them, because they were sinners, and uh, yet you did greater sins than they did, and I judged you because of your sins. And God says to them, I'm going to be the one who's going to restore Samaria and uh, Sodom with my covenant, with my covenant. And here are some verses that uh, God would humble his people. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. The lofty looks of a man shall be humbled, you know what the lofty looks of a man is? When a man thinks he's Don Juan and he's walking around that he's God's gift to women? That's the lofty looks. The lofty looks of a man shall be humbled. And the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty. And upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. When the Lord comes back, he's going to humble the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the inhabitants of uh, Israel. They're going to be humbled when they see the Lord. And twice in this chapter, uh, chapter 16, God affirms that He's going to establish His covenant with Jerusalem. First in verse 60, He says, I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. And again in verse 62, He says, I will establish my covenant. If this is the law of second mention. When God mentions something twice in the Bible, you can take it to the bank. There's no ambiguity about it. God will establish Jerusalem again. Now there's a teaching called Reformation Theology uh, slash Replacement Theology that teaches that the church has taken over the promises of Israel. That is false doctrine. The church has not taken up the, over the promises of Israel. In fact, the church has been made a partaker of the promises of Israel. The promises of Israel shall stand and God shall establish His covenant with His people and make the city of Jerusalem His everlasting, His eternal city, and Israel will be the head nation of the world and is going to be uh, God's nation. God will establish Israel as the head, head nation. Again, we mentioned that before. This is a type of our salvation. When you, when you and I got saved, God made a covenant with us. He made an eternal covenant with us. In Romans 8, 37 through 39, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors toward him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No matter how bad it gets, God's always going to keep you. Remember, Christian, if you are saved, if you are saved, there is nothing that will break that bond between you and God. Nothing. You can backslide as much as you want. We may question your salvation. Us, those of us who see you live like the devil. But if you are truly saved, if you are truly born again, uh, you are God's. Now again, only God knows those who are His. When I see a Christian backslide and fall away, I may question whether they were saved or not. But that's as far as I can go. It's, that's long. That's all, the only thing I can do. I cannot pronounce them lost or saved because only God knows their heart. It usually happens when people stray from God that they begin doubting their salvation. That's the devil working on you, try to make you doubt your salvation. And then if you live outside the will of God, you will have condemnation. The devil will condemn you. The Holy Spirit will convict you. And you yourself will start questioning. You see, so the best thing is to stay in the will of God and you won't have to worry about these things. No matter how bad it gets though, uh, there's always restoration. And the only way to over overcome your doubts, a lot of Christians struggle with, with the assurance of salvation. They struggle with it. The only way to struggle with that is to get right with God. And guess what happens when you get right with God? The struggle goes away. The struggle goes away. Am I lost? Am I saved? Am I lost? Am I saved? That's the devil working on you. Get right with God. John, John Calvin asks, how do I know if I am predestined? Well, you are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, John. There's a question that came from, from somebody online. You are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Predestined means to be something, to go somewhere, and to do something. We are predestined to be something, 
to go somewhere and to do something. Does that make sense? Predestination has nothing to do with salvation. Once you get saved in Christ, then you're predestined. Hopefully that answers John Calvin's question. So now, you may break the covenant you have with God, but God says he will never break his covenant with you. If you have been truly born again, and this goes to our friend John here, John, if you have been truly born again, you're eternally secure in God. Because God said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. That's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. My kids are laughing because this guy, because of John. They know John. Anyways, I'll give you another verse. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to read you Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And then I just, I'm going to chase the scroll here for a moment. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a work, good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. How many of you guys have heard this verse? Philippians 1, 6. That is, <coughs> Philippians 1, 6. Now, what I want to do is people always quote Philippians 1, 6. Now, what I want you to do, I want you to open your Bible to Philippians 1, chapter 1, verse 5. Now, God has begun a good work in you, and God will finish that work. But they all forget to quote verse 5. Now, God has begun a good work in you. But do you think God's going to finish that work that has begun in every single Christian? No. You're going to go to heaven. Guaranteed. No. It takes cooperation. And that's verse 5. Verse 5 says, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So, for God to complete the work that He has begun in you, you have to remain in fellowship, in the fellowship of the gospel. Do you see that? I teach, I don't teach, the Bible teaches, all the promises have what? Prerequisites. All the promises have prerequisites. Now, what does not have a pre prerequisite? It begins with a C. O. B. Covenant? Yes. Covenants do not have prerequisites, okay? Because a covenant is something that God's going to do no matter what you do. God told Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation. He gave that covenant to Abraham, and well, guess what God's going to do? Regardless of what Abraham did from then on, God's going to come. Did you see that difference? Promises have prerequisites. Covenants are from God. Now I'm going to pick up the pages that fell from my Bible. In case you thought I got raptured off from the screen. But uh, I didn't. I, didn't, I was predestined to be raptured. That is true. <clears throat> so, let's continue on. Can you repeat that again? Promises have... Promises have prerequisites. Like, for example, we all quote the promises. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So that means God's working on you until the rapture. Does that make sense? God's working on me until the rapture. Um, and covenants are just... That has nothing to do with the conditions. God gives a covenant and God's going to make. But God gave a covenant to Abraham. We have five covenants in the Bible. The Noahic covenant. The um, the Abrahamic covenant. There's five covenants. I'm trying to remember them. The Noahic, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Davidic, and the New Covenant. Okay, the New Covenant. Don't worry about that. It's in the book of James. Oh, okay. Don't worry about that. And we also dealt with covenants at the beginning of uh, when we said how to teach, how to teach the Bible. So, Sorry. <coughs> so five covenants, seven dispensations, perhaps the eighth one. Okay, so now let's uh, let's go to Zechariah. <coughs> Excuse me. I have this lingering cough the past few days. So God tells us that one day, one day in the future. Jerusalem will finally be right with God, but not before they get punished some more. Now, Jerusalem and Israel still have some more punishment to, uh, to endure. Uh, and uh, who, knows, who knows how many more years of punishment Jerusalem and Israel have left. Seven years, right? Everybody know that? There's still seven years left for God to punish Jerusalem and Israel. And when is God going to punish them? That's right, during the tribulation, after the rapture, correct. I thought maybe not. Now he's going to punish them, because Daniel tells us, Daniel tells us there are, uh, after, the, after Jesus Christ is crucified, 
after the Messiah is cut off, there yet remaineth seven, we uh, seven weeks. Um, one week? One week, yes, thank you. One week of punishment. Daniel the prophet Daniel tells us. After the Messiah is cut off, there's yet one more week. So let me read to you uh, the day that Israel will be ashamed and confounded and mourn when they see the true Messiah. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 through 12. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. That's the new covenant. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of Hadadrimon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn, every family apart, the family of the house of... Now, I want you to pay attention to this verse. Because the Holy Spirit tells us from who the Mary was going to come from, okay? Mary, the mother of Jesus, not the mother of God, that's Catholic. That's Mary is not the mother of God. Mary is the mother of Jesus, Jesus right? Does God have a mother? No. No. Because he's eternal. He's, he's eternal. Remember, it's the body we're talking about. Zechariah 12.12 12. And the land shall mourn every family apart. The family of the house of David apart, the throne, the crown, and their wives apart, and the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. You see that? Who is Nathan? That's one of David's sons. Nathan was one of David's sons. Who came from David's son, Nathan? They did. Mary. Mary. That's right. See that? Now the Holy Spirit knew that, so he put that in there. Just a, That's just a, a nugget there for you, Zechariah chapter 12, 12. So God punishes us in order to humble us, so that we don't get in the same mess again through our pride. And do you know what keeps someone from getting saved? One word. Pride. Because they do not want to say or admit that they need to get saved. I don't need to get saved. I'm good. I'm okay. What keeps a Christian get from getting right with God? Pride. Pride. I'm good. I'm okay. I don't need to. I actually heard one guy tell me, I don't need to repent of my sins anymore. All my sins were forgiven me. Were forgiven me on the cross. So you said it's not part of it. <laughs> Do I say what Sherry just said? Yes. So stupid yeah. is not part of it. <laughs> He actually believed, I don't know where he got the doctrine from, that he no longer has to repent of his sins because once he got saved, Christ forgave him from all his sins. What do you, what do, you do with John 1.9? Not 9? if you did some more. <laughs> Not if you did some more, correct. You don't get lost. You don't get lost. No. But you still have well, to... Well, you might feel lost. You, yeah, you might feel lost. <laughs> yes, I like that. Pat said you might feel lost. But yes, but you need to repent of your sin and get forgiveness again. So and sometimes you know God will let sometimes God will let you fall on your own to keep you humble to show you that you are not as holy as you think you are. Sometimes God will let you fall. He'll watch you fall, and He'll let you fall flat on your face. He's okay. going to sit back and He's going to watch you, just to keep you humble, just to tell you that you're not as holy and as good as you think you are. First Corinthians ten twelve says, "Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth." Take heed lest he fall. Oh, I'm a spiritual Christian. God says, oh yeah, watch this. <laughs> That's all those videos, those uh, Darwin Awards. That's how they begin. <laughs> watch this. So when God's judgment is complete, and God says, when my judgment is complete, and I have judged Jerusalem to its fullest, I will be pacified. I will be comforted. We looked at that in a few, uh, several lessons ago. And then... God will completely restore Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 33, 20 says, Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be move, removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. Who do you think, who knows what this is talking about, the cords and the stakes? Reference to the Old 
Tabernacle. That's right, reference to the old tabernacle, because it was held together by cords and stakes. Isaiah 52, verse 8. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring again Zion. You see that? The future restoration of Jerusalem. It includes God's outsporing, uh, God's outsporing. Uh, two words with one. That's what happens when you put God and Spirit and outpouring together. Outpouring. When the pouring of God's Spirit upon uh, Pat, we all, we all, we all say stupid things. <laughs> You're not the only one. You're not the only one. Uh, the the outpouring of God's Spirit upon the remnant of Israel, and that's part of the new covenant. The new covenant. God promised He's going to pour His Spirit upon the inhabitants of J Jerusalem. And this, this uh, we talked about the promise of the New Covenant in Ezekiel chapter 11. You can look at that in Lesson 13. So now we come to the end of chapter 16. Do you see how God takes us? He takes us with the beginning. How uh, He took Jerusalem, He cleaned her, He raised her, He made her beautiful, splendid, majestic, glorious, wonderful, and then she turned her back and committed adultery and fornication against her God. And God says, I'm going to punish you. I'm going to make you ashamed of yourself. But when my punishment is done, I'm going to be comforted, and then I'm going to restore you back to your full glory, to the glory that I had intended for you at the beginning. So now we come to chapter 17, and we have a, a few minutes left. Uh, a riddle of two eagles and a vine, chapter 17. <clears throat> a very uh, weird chapter. So chapter 17, we'll begin verse 1 through 6. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying... Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, A great eagle with wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came unto Lebanon. <coughs> came unto Lebanon. Came from Greece. Came from Greece? No, the, the great eagle, unfortunately, did not come from Greece. Yeah. Uh, came unto Lebanon, and took the highest branch of the cedar. He cropped off the top of his young twigs, and carried it into a land of traffic, and he set it in the city of merchants. He took also the seed of the land, and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters, and set it as a willow tree. And it grew, and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches turned toward him, and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine, and brought forth branches, and shot forth sprigs. Now if you read that, you say, what in the world is happening here? We'll try to unpack that for you. Now Ezekiel, the prophet, was commanded by God to pronounce... Uh, a, both a riddle and a parable. A riddle is usually a statement, a question or phrase containing a double or veiled meaning presented as a puzzle that needs to be solved. It's a word puzzle. A parable, on the other hand, is a simple story used to illustrate a spiritual truth. Uh, who used parables? Jesus. Jesus did. Jesus used a lot of parables to portray spiritual principles. So, it's a riddle in that it needs to be explained. It's a parable in that, is, in that it is an illustration of the children of Israel. Uh, kids love riddles. A few weeks ago, my kids told me a riddle. What do you have to buy to eat, but you don't eat? And, uh, and uh, what do you have to buy to eat, but you don't eat? Now, what, the riddles are, are uh, tricky because sometimes you, all you got to do is omit one word and it sets you off on a different tangent. And the answer was cutlery. What do you buy to eat? Let's eat. So when you're eating, what do you need? A fork and a knife and plate and all that kind of stuff. What do you buy to eat with? They move the word with and they say comma, but you don't eat. It's cutlery. But it's English. Yeah, it's English because you say let's eat, right? When you say let's eat, you take the plates, the food, the cutlery and all that. Anyways, um, from this verse we know that this parable, this parable riddle, I'll call it a parable riddle, is directed to the house of Israel. And uh, you may think at first glance that these eagles are have to do with the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. That's what I would have thought immediately. But that's not the case. That's not the case. The, the parable begins with a large and majestic eagle that clipped a branch from a cedar in Lebanon. So that eagle went all the way to Lebanon and had to grab a branch. Couldn't find it anywhere else. It had to be Lebanon. Then the eagle carried this branch to a land of, to a land of trade. Uh, 
The eagle then also takes seed from the land, the same land that the cedar tree grew up in, and he sets the seed on a well-watered, fertile field, and the seed grows up into a low-spreading vine. So you get the picture? So this eagle comes in Lebanon, takes a branch, takes it to a land of traffic, comes back, takes some seed from the same land of Lebanon, <coughs> and then takes it back to the same land of traffic and plants the seed and the seed grows up into a into a low spreading vine. Lebanon, no, it, it, it went to a land of trade. It does not imply that Lebanon was not a land of trade. So now we have in verse 7 we're introduced to a second eagle. To a second eagle, verse 7. There was also another eagle, great eagle, with great wings and with many feathers. And behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him, and shot forth her branches toward him, that he might water it by the furrows of her plantation. It was planted in a good soil by great waters, that it might bring forth branches, and that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. So here we have a second eagle. The vine the first eagle planted, and grew up to be a low-spreading vine, this vine tried to spread its roots and its branches toward the second eagle in, in hoping that the second eagle would water it. You see that? Verse 8 tells us though that this makes no sense because the vine was already planted by well, a well-watered valley. And it was planted there so that it may bear fruit, so that it can grow up and bear fruit. The first eagle was a bird of action and this second eagle took no action. He was just simply there. So now, if you're confused, that's okay, because uh, in verse 9, God is going to start unpacking this riddle parable, or parable riddle, for us. Verse 9, say thou, thus saith the Lord God, shall it prosper, talking about the vine, shall he not pull up the roots thereof, and cut off the fruit thereof, that it wither, referring to the first eagle, it shall wither in all the leaves of her spring, even without great power of many people to pluck it up by the roots thereof. Yea, behold, being planted, shall it prosper? Shall it not utterly wither when the east wind toucheth it? It shall wither in the furrows where it grew. So God is saying that this vine is going to wither because it's wanting the second eagle to help it. And God says it's going to wither when the east wind comes and touches it. So God is asking the fate of, it's basically a rhetorical question that God is asking. He says, shall he not pluck its roots and pull off its fruit and leave it to wither? So basically God is saying, when the first eagle, here have my notes, second eagle, it's actually the first eagle. When the first eagle sees that this vine and wants the second eagle to help it, God says, don't you think the first eagle is going to come back and destroy the vine? Now, He's going to explain to us what all this means. So the issue is facing, the issue facing the vine is as follows. Will the vine survive after it has turned away from the first eagle and oriented itself toward the second eagle? That's what God is basically, in a nutshell, that's what God is basically saying. God's saying this vine has grown up. God is saying, do you think this vine is going to survive as it tries to get help from the second eagle? And the answer is no. The east wind will dry it up and it will, be, it will be withered away. So now we come to verse 11. And if you're confused, that's okay because God is going to explain this parable to us. There are many people who believe the Bible is a hard book to understand. For the most part, this is what I've learned. You take the Bible literally. You take it at face value and never take it outside of its context. Never take one verse in isolation. You gotta be careful. Uh, when I was a kid, I was taught, they that shall endure to the end shall be saved. And I was taught as a kid that that verse teaches you're gonna lose your salvation because it was taken out of context. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with whether you make it alive through the tribulation. They who endure the tribulation, who make it through the tribulation are gonna be saved alive at the end. Context is very important when you try to interpret scriptures. And 
whenever a, the Bible is very figurative or talks about parables or allegories, you know who's going to explain it to us? God. God himself is going to explain to us in the Bible. He himself is going to give us the interpretation. So in the second half of this chapter, and I don't think we'll finish it this evening, God tells us what it means. So bear with me a few minutes as we open up the interpretation, and then we'll continue it up next week. Verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now God's going to start explaining to us the parable. Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? Tell them. God is saying Ezekiel. They're going to hear the parable, and they're not going to know what this means. And you're going to explain it to them, Ezekiel. Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and hath taken the king thereof, and the princes thereof, and led them with him to Babylon. And he hath taken of the king's seed, and made a covenant with him, and hath taken an oath of him, he hath also taken the mighty of the land. So the king of Babylon came and took the king. And then what he did, he left the king's seed in the land, of the king's seed, that's the family of the king, and he made a covenant with him, and he took an oath of him. He hath also taken the mighty of the land, that the kingdom might be base, this kingdom is Israel, that it might not lift itself up, but that by keeping of his covenant it might stand. But he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt. Now this had not happened yet. When Ezekiel is prophesying, this had not happened yet. But he, the king that is left in the land, rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt, that he might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Who is this talking about? The king. The king that is trying to get help from Egypt. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape or do such things? Or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? So now God begins to give us the meaning of this parable. But before he does, he tells Ezekiel, Know ye not what the, these things mean? What does this remind you of? When I read this verse, the first thing came to my mind was the question that Jesus asked of his disciples in Mark 4.13. And Jesus said to them, Know ye not this parable? And how shall ye know all parables? You see the, the, the relationship between those two questions? So the first eagle represents the king of Babylon. And Lebanon represents Jerusalem. So the young twig that was cropped off the highest branch of the cedar represented Judas king Jehoiakim and his princes. You have Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, Zedekiah. So when the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem, <coughs> he took Jehoiakim back to Babylon. And he made who king in his place? Zedekiah. Zedekiah. And we read that in 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 15. And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon, and the king's mother, and the king's wives, and his officers, and the mighty of the land. Those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. So this is the great eagle. And when he crops off, crops off the twig from the cedar tree, he is basically taking Jehoiakim back to Babylon. And the seed and the vine represent the king's offspring, the king's descendants, Zedekiah. Now, how is Zedekiah related to Jeconiah or Jehoiakim? He is his uncle. Zedekiah is Jehoiakim's uncle. So he's of the seed. They're both related. They're the same family. They're part of Josiah's family, King Josiah's family. The first eagle made a covenant with the vine, that is with Zedekiah, and he put him under oath. So let me read to you 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 10. Are you following me so far? The eagle, Babylon, king of Babylon, came into Lebanon, which represents Jerusalem, cut off the branch, which is Jehoiakim, and took the branch into a land of traffic, took the branch back into Babylon. And then he took the seed from Lebanon, and he planted the seed, and the seed grew up into a vine, representing Zedekiah. Representing Zedekiah. 
So, 2 Chronicles 36.10. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon. This him here is Jehoiakim, with goodly vessels of the house of the Lord, and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. Now, was Zedekiah Jeho Jehoiakim's brother? No. What, is it, what does it mean here by brother, when it says his brother? What does that mean, his brother? His relative, right, his relative. What do we call a relative? My brothers. Okay. Our sisters and brothers, right? So, he took Jehoiakim back to Babylon and made his uncle, his brother, Zedekiah, the king. And he made a covenant with him, and as long as Judah obeyed and submitted to the king, all will be well. And it was the will of God that they submit to the king. The slow spreading vine was King Zedekiah. And the second eagle represented the Pharaoh of Egypt. The vine wanted help from this eagle. And that's why he was trying to stretch his roots and his leaves towards the second eagle. Help me, O oh great second eagle. Help me, O oh great second eagle. But he, the second eagle couldn't help him. Why? Because the first eagle was bigger and more powerful. So the second eagle is just flying around saying, I can't do nothing. So now let me, let me read you the verses now. So far it makes sense? Everybody following kind of? A little bit? A little bit? Yeah, a little bit. Jeremiah chapter, you may, you may have to listen to the lesson again. So let me read you the verses now. Jeremiah chapter 37 verse 4. <laughs> now Jeremiah came in and went out among the people, for they had not put him into prison. Then Pharaoh's army was come forth out of Egypt, and when the Chaldeans that besieged Jerusalem heard tidings of them, they departed from Jerusalem. Then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Thus shall ye say to the king of Judah that sent you unto me to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt into their own land. You see that? So Zedekiah wanted help from the king of Egypt, who happened to be the Pharaoh. And God said to Jeremiah, tell the king that the Egyptians are going to go back. They're not going to help you. And then God said in this parable that the vine would not prosper. And here we come to the end of the lesson. The vine would not prosper. Zedekiah would not prosper because he did not submit to the king Nebuchadnezzar. Now, why was that important? Why was that important? I'll read you from Jeremiah 27 why this was important. But the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, those will I let remain still in their own land, saith the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell therein. And I spake to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why will ye die, thou and my people, by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence, as the Lord hath spoken against the nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? So, do you see that it was God's will for them to submit to the king of Babylon? Through the prophet Jeremiah, God told the people of Jerusalem, Submit to the king of Babylon, Zedekiah. Submit to him and serve him. Bring your neck under his authority. But they would not. They would not submit to the king of Babylon. And because King Zedekiah did not submit to the king of Babylon, that was the cause of the destruction, the death of many inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many people suffered. Many people suffered because the king Zedekiah did not submit to God. Do you see how your submission to God can affect others underneath you and around you? Do you see that? Submitting to God's will is the best course of action for the child of God. And if you follow God and you're in the center of God's will, you'll be at peace and you will have freedom. And if you follow God, He will lead you into peace and into freedom. And you will be protected in the center of God's will. And not only that, but you will also spare those around you from destruction. And that's why it's so important, if you are the head of the household, that you follow God. That's why it's so important. The King Zedekiah was over the land of Jerusalem. And had he said, we're going to submit to the King of Babylon. Do you know what would have happened? 
The temple would have still been there. Jerusalem would have still been there. God said, I'm going to leave you in your land and you're going to prosper in your land because you submitted to the king. But they didn't. And because they didn't submit to King Nebuchadnezzar, what happened? King Nebuchadnezzar come, came back and he destroyed the entire city. He burned the temple and many, many people perished. So we, we're going to continue in chapter 17 next week. So Lord willing, we'll uh, see you uh, same time, same place next week.